Chapter 1. Designing Game Feel There is no standard definition of game feel. As players and game designers, we have some beginnings of common language, but we have never collectively defined game feel above what's necessary for discussing a specific game. We can talk about the feel of a game as being floaty, or responsive, or loose, and these descriptions may even have meaning across games. As in, we need to make our game feel more responsive, like asteroids. But if I ask 10 working game designers what game feel is, as I did in preparation for writing the, this book, I get 10 different answers. And here's the thing, each of these answers is correct. Each answer describes a different facet, a different area, uh, which is crucial to game feel. To many designers, game feel is about intuitive controls. A good feeling game is one that lets players do what they want when they want without having to think too much about it. Good game feel is about making a game easy to learn but difficult to master. The enjoyment is in the learning, uh, in the perfect balance between player skill and the challenge presented. Uh, feelings of mastery bring their own intrinsic rewards. Another camp focuses on physical interactions with virtual objects. It's all about timing, about making players fe really feel the impact, about the number of frames each move takes, or about how polished the interactions are. Other designers insist that game feel is all about making the players feel as though they're really there, as though they're in the game. All their efforts go into creating a feel that seems more realistic to players, uh, which somehow increases the sense of immersion, a term that is also loosely defined. Finally, to some designers, game feel is all about appeal. It's all about the layering on effect after careful effect, uh, polishing every interaction no matter how trivial, until interacting with the game has a foundation of aesthetic pleasure. The problem is unity. How do these experiences become a cohesive whole? They tell us a they all tell us something about game feel, but they do not help us define it. St. Augustine's comment about defining time comes to mind. What then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him who asks, I do not know. Game feel is the same way. Without close examination, we know what it is. Try to define it and explanation quickly unravels into best practices and personal experiences. This book is about how to make good feeling games, but first we need to be clear about what game feel is. We need to separate the conditions that are necessary for game feel. Excuse me. We need to separate. Uh, we need a definition that enables us to separate the conditions that are necessary for game feel from the judgments that make a game feel a certain way. What is the underlying phenomena? Apart from our own experiences and the craft and knowledge of building games. What are the building blocks? Just what is game feel? Three building blocks of game feel. Game feel, as experienced by players, is built from three parts. Real-time control, simulated space, and polish. Real-time control is a specific form of interactivity. Like all interactivity, it includes at least two participants. In this case, the computer and the user, who come together to form a closed loop, as illustrated in figure 1-1. The concept couldn't be simpler. The user has some input, which is expressed to the computer in the form of the user's input. The computer rec reconciles the input with its own internal model and outputs the result. The user then perceives the changes, thinks about how they compare to the original intent, and formulates a new action, which is expressed to the computer through another input. Here's figure 1-1. Interactivity involves the exchange of information and action between at least two participants. In his book, Chris, Cross Chris Crawford on Game Design, uh, a game, game designer Chris Crawford likens the process to a conversation, a cyclical process in which two active agents alternatively and metaphorically listen, think, and speak. The conversation figure 1.2 uh, begins when one participant, Bob, speaks... The other participant, Bill, listens to what was said, thinks about it, formulates a response, and speaks in return. Now it's Bill, Bob's turn to listen, think, and speak, and so on. In Crawford's model, a computer replaces one of the participants, listening to the player's input via the input device, thinking about processing that input, and changing system state, and speaking via the screens and speakers, figure 1-3. interactivity as conversation. However, the metaphor of a conversation between human and computer doesn't fit all situations. Real-time control is not like a conversation. 
It's more like driving a car. If a driver wants to turn left, it's more action than thought. He turns the wheel in the corresponding direction using what he sees, hears, and feels to make small corrections until the turn is complete. The process is nearly instantaneous. The conversation takes place in minute incre increments below the level of consciousness, an uninterrupted flow of command. The result of input feels as though it is perceived in the same moment it's expressed. This is the basis of game feel, precise, continuous control over a moving avatar. This is a starting point for our dis definition of game feel. Conversation between humor, human, computer, and... Uh, excuse me. The conversation between human and computer is expressed in figure 1.3. Real-time control of virtual objects. The problem with this definition is context. Imagine a ball suspended in a field of black, blank whiteness. How would you be able to tell if it were moving? Without the backdrop of space to move through, there can be no motion. More importantly, there can be no physical interaction between objects. For the sense of interacting physically with the game world, there needs to be some kind of simulated space. Let me hide this. Sorry about that. Just a moment. Playable example. If you're near your computer, open the game fuel examples chapter 1-1 to experience the necessity of context. This is a first person shooter game. Use the WASD keys to move around and a mouse to aim. Can you feel the motion? No? Now press the one key. With the simulated space, there is feel. Let me see if I can do that. Give me just a minute to install this. So we are playing the game now. Can't really see too much of anything here. I'll press the one key to toggle world visibility. Okay, so we have a little bit of context here. Now we have two, we have only a four. Kind of hard to get a sense for how we're moving here. One on, two on. I think we saw what we need to here. Let's X out of that. Let's get back to the text. Simulated space. Simulated space refers to a, a simulated physical interaction in a virtual space uh, perceived actively by the player. This means collision detection, uh, response between a real-time controlled avatar and objects in a game world. 
It also means level design, the construction and spacing of objects relative to the speed of, uh, of the avatar's movements. This interaction gives meaning to the motion of an avatar by providing objects to move around in between, to bump into, and to use uh, as a frame of reference for the impression of speed. This gives us the tactile physical sense of interacting with virtual environments the same way we interact with our everyday physical spaces. Using the avatar as a channel for expression and perception, uh, we experience game world as a tactile physical level of the world around us. Uh, playable example, open example, uh, chapter 1-2 to experience the difference, move around and feel the sensation of control. Now press the one key to enable collisions. Feel how different that is? Let's pull that up too. Oh, just the square moving around. You got these blue tiles. They don't really do much of anything, though. Let's get out of that and get back to the text. Other necessary component for a simulated, simulated space is that it must be actively perceived. Perception happens on a scale of uh, passive to active. The interaction of objects you see on TV and films is passively perceived. Exploring a simulated space using real-time control is active perception. Game feel is active perception. The key question is, how does the player interact with the space? Some games have detailed uh, collision response systems and level design, but the player does not experience them directly. StarCraft is an example of a game like this, where we'll, we'll see in a moment. In other games, space is an abstraction. Games with grids, tiles, and hexagonal movement uh, use space abstractly. This is not a simulation of space in the literal sense, which is uh, the sense we're after. Game feel as we're defining it means active perception of literal space. If we add the concept of context to our definition, it, becomes, it becomes a real-time control of virtual objects in simulated space. This definition is close, uh, but with it, we are ignoring the impact of animation, sound, particles, and camera shake. Without these polish effects, much of the feel of a game is missing. Uh, there are objects interacting with only simulated response, giving us clues about whether they're heavy, light, soft, sticky, metallic, rubber, and so on. Polish sells interaction by providing these clues. Polish. Polish refers to any effect that artificially enhances interaction without changing the underlying simulation. This could mean dust particles at a character's feet um, as it slides, a crash in sound when two cars collide, a camera shake to emphasize uh, a weighty impact, or keyframed animations that make characters seem to squash and stretch as it moves. Polish, polish effects uh, add appeal and emph emphasize the physical nature of interactions, helping designers sell those objects to the player as real. This is separate from interactions such as collision, which feed back into the underlying uh, simulation. For example, if you take away the animations from Street Fighter 2, you end up with something like figure 1-4. Street Fighter 2 without animation, just weird fighting boxes. If all polish were, remo were removed, um, the essential functionality of the game would be un unaltered, but the player would find the experience less perceptually convincing and therefore less appealing. This is because for players, uh, simulation and polish are indistinguishable. Feel can be just as strongly influenced by polish effects as by a collision system. For example, a simple squash and stretch animation layered on top of a moving character can radically change the feel of a game, um, as the creators of the popular student game De Blob discovered. A post from uh, Juiced Von Donchen uh, reported that when the ball bounces, it moves very fast, it slightly deforms, and while rolling, it slightly sags. On screenshots, this is 
quite a subtle subtle effect, uh, but when seen seen in action, it looks really fun. An interesting detail is that it changes the feel of the gameplay entirely. Um, without the squash shader, the game feels like uh, playing with a ball made of stone. Mm. Excuse me. Then when no changes to the physics at all, the squash shader makes it feel more like a ball of paint. Nice to see how the player can be perceived. Er, nice to see how the player can be deceived about gameplay using graphics only. See figure one dash five. Uh, assembling these three elements: real-time control, simulated space, and polish into a single experience, we arrive at a basic workable definition of game feel. Real-time control of virtual objects in the simulated space, with interactions emphasized by polish. The player controls the avatar. The avatar interacts with the game environment and polish effects emphasize those interactions and provide additional appeal. Examples. The definition that naturally flows is, does game X have game feel? Uh, with our basic definition, we can classify most games this way. For example, Sonic the Hedgehog has game feel, um, while Civilization 4 does not. Sonic has real-time control, while Civ Civ 4 is turn-based, uh, placing it outside of our definition. But to say that Civ 4 has no feel whatsoever seems wrong. It has polished effects, animations, sounds, and particles, and these alter the feel of interacting with the game, especially when things are clicked and when armies clash. What this indicates is that there are different types of game feel. See figure 1.6. Figure 1.5 so shows the squash and stretch effect in the student version of Diblob. So you can see it offers a different perception of what's going on, um, despite no changes to gameplay logic. Here's uh, figure 1.6. We have real-time control, spatial, spatial simulation, uh, and polish. With different games spread out, being in different zones with some overlap. In the center, uh, where all three intersect, is true game feel. Games like Half-Life, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Super Mario 64 reside here. These games have all the components of game feel as we've defined it. Uh, this type of game feel is the topic of this book. And then section two is raw game feel. Uh, even without polished effects, the simulation of collisions gives the, the expression of physical interaction between objects. But much of the appeal and sense of physical interaction is lost. Games are almost never released without polished effects. But you can play an example in chapter 1-3 to get a, a sense of what this feels like. Press 2 once you've... Uh, Open the game. I can I can do that for you guys. Or maybe I can't. Uh, looks like there's only chapter one. Dash one and one dash two. Unfortunately, it looks like they're not here. Bummer. This is pure aesthetic sensation of control. Um, there is polished real time control, but no substance to the interactions in section three. Um, this feels weird with sounds and particles, uh, but no simulated interaction space. It feels like seeing behind the curtain. There's a dissonance for the player. The particle effects and sound convey some impression of physical reality, but there's a mismatch between the motions of the object and the polished cues. Uh, without simulation, it's difficult to create a, a sense of a physical interaction. There are rarely games that have this combination of, of real-time control and polish, but which uh, excludes spatial simulation. To experience this, uh, press the 3 in the example. That's not really displayed there. In section four here, um, there's physical simulation used for uh, voracious sensation and to drive gameplay. Games like Peggle, uh, Globos, and Armadillo Run use simulation this way. In these games, there's a detailed physical simulation driving interactions between objects, um, but the resulting sensations are perceived passively because the player has no real-time control. In the same way, polished effects like sound and particles may serve to emphasize the interaction between objects or make them more appealing. 
be sensations are perceived passively, um, as they would be in a film or a cartoon. In section 5 of the Venn, Venn diagram, uh, this is naked real-time control without polished or simulated space. Um, again, I can't think of an example of a game that uses only real-time control without any kind of polished or simulated effects. In section 6, within spatial simulation, um, this is naked spatial simulation. The best example that I'm aware of is the freeware game Bridge Builder. This is a physical simulation driving the motion of the object, but it's perceived passively. And lastly, there's naked polish. Games like Civ 5 and, and uh, Bejeweled use polished effects this way without real-time control or spatial simulation. And these game polished effects sell the nature of the interactions, giving objects a, a weight, presence, volume, and so on. But these perceptions are indirect. Let's apply. Where does, say, StarCraft sit on the di diagram? At first glance, uh, StarCraft uh, appears to have real-time control. You can click at any time to specify new orders for your units. While moving units, you can update their destination as quickly as you can spam clicks onto the screen. But control of the unit is not an uninterrupted flow from player to game. Each click is, moment is a momentary impulse of control that ends as quickly as it starts. You set the destination, but don't guide the journey. This is not quite real-time control in the sense that we're after. This also appears to be a, a simulated space. Excuse me. Uh, it also appears to be a simulated space StarCraft. Units run into cliffs, structures, and rocks. But precisely those things that would lend a physical tactile sensation, steering around objects, aiming, and choosing when to fire, are handled by the computer. This is a simulated space with collisions and inter interactions. Um, but perceived indirectly by the player. The one thing StarCraft has in abundance is polish. These units have detailed animations, sound, and particles that sell their interaction with the game world and each other. The feel of StarCraft comes from these polish effects, and it is solid. Ah, uh, Zerglinger Scamper, Marines Trudge, and uh, everything explodes spectacularly when destroyed. This puts StarCraft on the Venn diagram in four, the intersection of, of spatial stimulation or spatial simulation and polish. This is not true game feel. Um, the control of units is not real time. The player cannot interact with a simulated space directly. Because it has only one of three criteria, StarCraft falls outside of our definition for game feel. Okay, okay. Breathe. Be calm. But before you get your zergling, zerglings in a bunch, uh, remember that definition is not value judgment. Or, excuse me, remember that definition is not value judgment. We're defining the medium of game feel, not saying anything about good or bad game feel, or about whether a game is good or bad generally. The animation sounds and particle effects in StarCraft are excellent, um, and as a game, it, it's unrivaled in terms of balance and system design. For the purpose of this book, uh, game feel means true game feel, the point at the center of our diagram. That is, games that include real-time control, spatial simulation, and polish. This book is about creating good-feeling games of that particular type. The other kinds of feel are important, but we have to draw the line somewhere. But what about a game like Diablo? This is where our definition gets a little murky. Does Diablo have real-time control or not? It seems real-time, but uh, the interface uh, is lots of clicking. What's the threshold for real-time control? And what about simulated space? A character in Diablo walks around and bumps into things, but is this actively perceived by the player? Does it feel like navigating a, an everyday physical space? We'll delve deeper into real-time control and simulated space in Chapter 2 to answer these questions. So no, actually, uh, both of these games uh, make use of a mouse cursor, cursor which is a form uh, of real-time control. In these cases, though, the cursor is intended to be a transparent parent interface to the interesting choices in the game. The usage is more like using a web page than playing cursor attack. So what can we do with this definition and the three uh, building blocks of game feel? To answer that question, let's now shift focus back to content, um, to expression, and to the expression of game feel itself. 
specifically um, let's go through some of the different experiences of game feel and examine how game designers can craft them using real-time control simulated space and polish experiences of game feel game feel is comprised of many different experiences for example the simple pleasure of control uh, feelings of mastery and clum clumsiness uh, and the tactile sensation of interfacing with virtual objects might all happen within a few seconds of picking up the controller. What we call game feel is the sum of all of these experiences blended together, coming to the surface at different times. To understand game feel, we need to understand the different experiences that comprise it, what they are, how they are crafted, and how they interrelate. The five most common examples of game feel are uh, the aesthetic sensation of control, the pleasure of learning, practicing, and mastering a skill, uh, extension of the senses, extension of identity, interaction with a unique physical reality within the game. The aesthetic sensation of control. When I was young, playing Frogger on uh, Rastan, playing Frogger and Rastan on my dad's uh, Commodore 64, uh, game feel was a toy. It was the delightful sense of, of puppetry I got when I controlled something in a game, but it felt like the game was controlling me too. I'd start leaning left and right in my chair, trying to move just a bit faster and more accurately. I'd pull my head a little to one side to try and see uh, around something on the screen. Most of all, it just felt great to see something on screen move and react to my button presses. It wasn't coordinated enough to really engage with the, or I wasn't coordinated enough to really engage uh, with the challenge of the game, but there was a pure aesthetic beauty to control. I loved this sensation and I played with it for hours. This was the experience of game feel as an aesthetic sensation of control. The pleasure of learning, practicing, and mastering a skill. A few years later, when I played Super Mario Brothers for the first time, I was super inept. I was playing with friends from down the block who were older and more coordinated and could afford their own Nintendo. My turn was short, blustering, and, and red-faced. Um, however, before I had to hand off the controller, I, I had the sense that even the smallest motion could produce a long chain of interesting events and feel intensely rewarding. Smash a block with your head and it jiggles and makes a, a silly little noise. Hit an attractive flashing question block in the same way and a coin pops out, accompanied by a shower of sound and animation. All of this rich low level interaction served to cushion the fact that at first the game was very challenging for a nine year old. It was okay to suck uh, because it was fun just to noodle around and bump into things. They even seem to be different skills, um, the same way you practice dribbling, kicking, and heading in soccer. For example, I had to learn to, to time my jumps, holding down the button for the right amount of time, and to feather my presses of the D-pad to control speed. Um, combing small incremental improvements uh, in these areas, or combining small incre incremental improvements in these areas, um, I started to get better and better, reaching higher levels of the game. Through Three weeks later, uh, when Bowser tumbled bug-eyed into the lava, I felt a powerful sense of accomplishment, like scoring the, the tie-breaking goal. I'd been playing soccer for two years, but this game gave me the same feeling of pride in just three weeks in one neatly wrapped package. Uh, there were skills to master, uh, rewards at every level, and a hyper-accelerated ramp of increasing challenges uh, upon which to test those skills. Even better, I didn't have to stop practicing because I was tired or because it was dark outside. This was the experience of game feel as a skill. Extension of the senses. I grew up a bit and learned how to drive a car. This learning was very similar to mastering the controls of a new game, but it seemed to take longer, to be less fun, and to lack built-in milestones against which I could measure my progress after a while. I began to develop a sense of how far the car extended around me in each direction. I could gauge how close I could drive to other cars, and whether or not my car would fit into the parking space in front of Galactian. Uh, to do this, I relied on a weird sort of intuition about how far the car extended around me, which made the car feel like a large, clumsy appendage. This was also like playing a game in a funny way. When I drove the car, as when I played Bionic Commando, I had a sense that the thing I was controlling uh, was an extension of my body. This was the experience of game feel as an extension of the senses. Extension of Identity um, After a memorable incident involving my parents, Volvo, I realized that this sensation could flow in both directions. Late for class, uh, I leapt in the car, threw it in reverse, and slammed the gas, turning as I did. It was great. 
I, I cringed, flinched, and swore viciously. Uh, I pulled my hands off the steering wheel as though it was scalding hot. I just smeared the car's side against a concrete pole. I still remember the feeling uh, as the car ground to a halt. It was as though I'd stubbed my toe in a big, expensive metal rending way. Interesting, I didn't think, oh darn, the car in which I'm sitting has come into contact with the concrete pole. I thought, oh crab apple, I hit a pole. That moment, when, when car hit the when car hit pole, the car was part of my identity, both physically and conceptually. Then I thought of my parents' reaction, and I was qu quickly snapped back into thinking of car and self as separate. One of us was in big trouble, and it wasn't the Volvo. No, uh, a now defunct but totally sweet arcade in Cupertino was Galactian, uh, Ca Calif, uh, hmm. Now defunct but once totally sweet arcade in Cupertino, you got eight tokens on the dollar. All the games were two tokens or less to play, and they had four-player air hockey. Around the same time, uh, I was playing Super Mario 64. It occurred to me, uh, after pulling the car, that a similar process happened as I controlled Mario. My identity would subs uh, yeah, subsume him when I was in the zone, but the moment I hit a Goomba uh, and was sent flying, I was suddenly pulled out, viewing him once again as a separate entity. This was the experience of game feel as uh, an extension of identity. Interaction with a unique physical reality within the game. This also made me aware of just how physical it felt to pilot Mario around. As Mario um, obligingly controlled with things in his world, getting to a halt with puffs of particle dust or a spray of yellow stars, it felt tactile and physical. These artifacts gave me a sense of the weight and mass of the things in Mario's world, as did his interactions with, with them. Some things as he could pick up, uh, uh, some things he could pick up and throw easily, like a small stone block. Some things like Bowser required uh, considerably more heft. Sometimes things would, would seem heavier or lighter than I imagined, though they ought to be. For example, uh, the eponymous snowman's head from the snowman's lost his head goal on a cool, cool mountain. The snowball is small, especially at first, and yet it pummels poor Mario out of the way every time. And yet it pummels poor Mario out of the way every time. This too seemed to have a, an analogy in the real world. Sometimes I would go to pick something up, a grocery bag, a, a piece of furniture that was rarely moved, nearly pull my arm out of socket trying to have the thing because it was much heavier than I'd expected. This was the experience of game feel as a unique physical reality. And the experiences of game feel. The aesthetic sensation of control is the starting experience of game feel. It is the pure aesthetic pleasure of steering something around and feeling it respond to input. When players say a game is floaty, smooth, or loose, this is the experience they're describing. An analogy from everyday life might be the feeling of different cars. A 2009 Porsche feels better to drive than a 1996 Ford Windstar. Experiencing game feel skill encompasses the process of learning. This includes the clumsiness of unfamiliar controls, the triumph of overcoming challenges, and the joy of mastery. Viewing game feel as skill explains how and why players experience the controls of a game differently as their skill level increases, what intuitive controls mean, and why some control schemes are easier to learn than others. The everyday analogy is learning a new skill, whether it's driving a car, juggling, or slicing carrots. Skillful control can also lead to the feeling of being in the zone, being one with the game and the laws of consciousness. If you've played a video game and lost track of time, you've experienced the sensation. You sit down to play a game for a few minutes and zone out, only to emerge hours later exhausted, elated, and fulfilled. In everyday life, this happens all the time. You can zone out while driving on the freeway, folding socks, or playing basketball. When players say, it feels like I'm really there. It's like I'm in the game. The world looks and feels realistic. The experience in game feels an extension of the senses. The game world becomes a real... The, the game world becomes real because the senses are directly overwritten by feedback from the game. Instead of seeing a screen, a room, and a controller in their hands, they see Azeroth, or the beaches of Normandy, or Donut Plains. This is because an avatar is uh, a tool for acting on the world and for perceiving it. There's no real life example uh, of this experience because the experience is the senses extending into the game, into a virtual reality. 
One result of this extension of the senses into the game world is the shifting of identities. Players will say, I'm awesome, during moments of skillful triumph and why did he do that when they fall, when they fail a moment later. Uh, with real-time control over an object, a player's identity becomes fluid. He can inhabit the avatar. The real-world analogy is, the, is identity uh, subsuming a car. You don't say, his automobile hit my automobile. You say, he hit me. Uh, as the player's senses are transported into the game world, they can also perceive virtual things the way they perceive everyday things through interaction. In perceiving things in, in, a, in a game this way, objects seem to take on detailed physical characteristics. Objects can be heavy, sticky, soft, sharp, and so on. When a player observes enough of these interactions, a cohesive picture of a self-contained, unique physical universe begins to emerge as the various clues are assembled into a mental model. This is the experience of game feel as a unique physical reality, as a game world with its own designer created the laws of physics. Figure 1.7 shows the whole thing put together. We got real time control, polish and simulated space. Uh, notice there's building blocks alongside experiences, skill and learning, flow, aesthetic sensation of control, appeal, unique, unique physical reality, spatial immersion, um, extended senses, and extended identity. Creating game feel. For the remainder of this chapter, let's, let's explore each of these different experiences in detail with focus on how the game designer can shape and build them. Game feel as the aesthetic sensation of control. There can be a thoughtless joy to controlling something in a game. People experience this while riding a skateboard, surfing, ice skating, or driving a car. It's the kinetic pleasure of moving through space, creating flowing arcs of motion, feeling your body or the thing you're controlling respond instantly to your impulses. Even without a specific goal in mind, there is an, an intrinsic pleasure to control. These sensations of control have some known aesthetic properties, as in the earlier example of the Porsche and the Ford Winster. The Porsche is smoother, handles better, has tighter control, has tighter cornering, and so on. In a video game, the same aesthetic properties of controls are in play. An avatar in motion can create Flowing organic curves as it moves uh, and enables the players to feel the aimless joy of control. These sensations are what the players mean when they say a game feels smooth, floating, or stiff. These sensations are, are a wonderful palette for game designers to draw on and use to engage players. See figure 1.8. When a game designer sits down to create a game uh, and has an idea for a particular feel in mind, the first task is mapping input signals to motion. The expressive potential is in the relationships. When a button gets pressed, is this response gradual or immediate? Does the avatar move forward relative to the screen or relative to itself? Here's uh, an example of the aesthetic sensation of control. How fast does it move forward relative to its rotation? The right relationships between input and response Controlling something in a game can achieve a kind of lyric beauty. The flip side is jarring, nauseating, or otherwise aesthetically unpleasing uh, motion resulting from player input. Mapping is a form of aesthetic expression. It defines how it will feel to control the avatar. As with most artistic endeavors, there is no formula for the right feel. It's up to the designer to make hundreds of tiny gestures about the intricate relationships between input and response. We'll explore this palette uh, of mapping and how it translates to, to game feel in greater detail in Chapter 7. For now, note that these are aesthetic judgments, and the resulting feel is an expression of the designer's sensibilities. Now imagine all the motions possible with, with one mapping. Every turn, twist, jump, and run. The sum total of all motions possible with mapping defines a possibility space for the player. This is not defining what a player will do, Rather, it is defining what he or she can do. Every moment, uh, every movement a player can ever accomplish with an avatar is defined by the designer's choices about how to correlate input to response. Each of the potential motions has an aesthetic character um, that will be expressed by the player if he or she steers the avatar through the action. The aesthetic pleasure has its own intrinsic reward and will encourage the player to explain, experience the possibility space by moving around in whatever way uh, seems most aesthetically pleasing to them. The problem is, without some kind of focus, even great feeling controls quickly wear thin. 
For a game designer, the solution to this problem is to add some kind of challenge. For the goal, motions uh, of control take on new meaning. Now it's possible to, to compare intent to outcome. So it's possible to succeed or fail. The aesthetic pleasure of control has become a skill. Game fuel as a skill. As I'm defining it here, uh, a skill is a learned pattern of coordinated muscle movement intended to achieve a specific result. To measure skill is to measure the efficiency with which uh, intent can be translated via action into results. If you're playing soccer, your intent may be to dribble through all the other players on, on the soccer field and bend the winning goal post, or and bend the winning goal past the, a floundering goalkeeper. In reality, this is one of many possible outcomes. It is much more likely that, that your skill will not be up to this level of challenge and you'll be stripped of the ball before you can get to the center line. But skills can be improved and increasing levels of challenge can be mastered. If your goal is to drill past one defender and make a deft pass to an open teammate, your odds of achieving that are relatively good. While this not, may not be the glowing level of pleasure you'd, be, you'd get from scoring the goal yourself, there are great feelings that have to be had uh, from small incremental victories. Even a particularly skillful kick or dribble while practicing in the backyard can feel wonderful because you know it can be later applied in the context of a soccer game. Soccer is a set of challenges so compelling that isolating and practicing the skills seem worthwhile even outside the context of the game. This is similar to the experience of playing Counter-Strike. I was so compelled by the challenges of, of the game, uh, I would boot up the level CS Italy uh, without other players and, and practice three skills, shooting a specific spot on the wall while moving side to side, uh, quickly moving my aiming cursor from one spot to the next and keeping the cursor on a single spot while I moved left and right, forward and back. I would sit in the level alone, practicing these three skills for two or three hours before I would ever play the game online. It seemed worthwhile to push myself into different high level, higher levels of skill. While this, uh, indicate, what this indicates is that game skill and real world skills are essentially the same. They learn patterns of coordinated muscle movements. The muscle movements are smaller, and the skills are more, more focused, and the motions are not constrained by physical reality. Uh, but the same process of learning and skill building occurs. The primary difference is that a video game designer has control over both the challenge and the physics. In the real world, um, there are a fixed set of properties, gravity, friction, and the psychology of the human body, the physiology of the human body, excuse me, and so on. Uh, the designers of soccer, uh, whoever they were, had to work around these fixed properties to create interesting, meaningful challenges. The palette consisted of, of lines of the ground, the size of the net, the physical properties of the soccer ball and rules like you can't touch the balls with your hands. Min Guzman Lee, the designer of Counter-Strike, uh, was able to craft everything. He not only created the rules and challenges of the game, but also defined how fast players could move, how high they could jump, how accurate their weapons would be, and what the values for gravity and friction would be in the game. Tweaking how the player moves and the creation of, of challenges both alter game feel. Changing the, the global values for gravity, friction, and speed of controlling movement uh, define the basic sensation of control. Adding rules and challenges then change the sensation by defining a set of skills to be practiced and mastered. The question is, how is skillful control a different experience from just control? The answer is that game feel and skill are related in three ways. Challenge alters the sensation of control by focusing the player on different areas of the possible possibility space of motion, uh, rewarding him or her for exploring it. The feel of game changes depending on the skill of the player. Players find controls to be intuitive when they can translate intent to outcome without ambiguity. Challenge alters the sensation of control. From the point of view of a game designer, there is a problem even with the best sensation of control. Controlled emotion is pleasurable, but that pleasure is fleeting. Even if the game feels great, um, aimlessly controlling something gets boring quickly. Part of the problem is that uh, if the aesthetic pleasure of control is only uh, encouragement, the player will experience just a small subset of the possible emotions. If we again imagine every possible motion of mapping a, uh, as a possibility space, the area explored by a player will be limited as in figure 110. However, with a specific goal to pursue, control takes on a new meaning. Aimless, pleasurable motion is replaced by focus, purposeful attempts to complete the challenges presented. This provides an incentive for players to, to find new areas of the possibility space, 
introducing them to sensations of controls they would have missed otherwise. Challenge provides a landbox in the distance, encouraging the player to explore the aesthetic frontiers of the game. For example, uh, a first-time player of Super Mario World will not experience all the sensations of the flying mechanic. It takes a lot of practice to learn the timing of feathering the button at the right moment, sustaining Mario in his sine wave pattern of flight. And yet, it's one of the most pleasurable sensations of controls in the entire game. Having access to the sensation, even just being aware of it, makes the game more appealing and engaging. Figure 111 for reference. Uh, without focus, the draw of control can become boring. Figure 110, uh, we see all the motions possible, and then the motions experience. Players only experience as much of a game's feel as the area of this space that they feel inclined to explore. With challenges, there there's a reason to explore more of the possible sensations of a particular map room. Motions possible and motions experience noted there. Challenges not only encourage exploration of all possible motions, but assign new meaning to them. This changes the feel of, of control. For example, think of a mouse cursor. This is a form of real-time control so ingrained that we rarely notice ourselves exercising it. But again, against the backdrop of a, of a different challenge, uh, mouse control can take on a different feeling, as in the web game Cursor Attack. Cursor Attack requires the player to move the cursor in a very precise path as quickly as possible to reach the goal point. Normally, the goal of using a mouse is to navigate a web page effectively and buy things like uh, consumer goods, or to, or to click, uh, drag, or otherwise manipulate the program on your computer. In Cursor Attack, there's an explicit goal uh, reach the end of the maze by touching the goal point on an implicit control. Go as fast as you can. The constraint is touching the wall of the maze, which causes an immediate game fo over. The result is a feeling of complete focus on the tiniest uh, motions of the mouse. This feels d very different from navigating a web page. It makes the mouse cursor's movement feel twitchy and much less precise. The cursor's size and its position in space suddenly become much more important. The skill requires a great deal of concentration, just like threading a needle or trying to draw a perfect circle on a chalkboard. Just by changing two goals uh, and one constraint, the feel of controlling a mouse cursor is new, fresh, and interesting. Uh, fortunately for game designers, real-time control lends itself to the creation of these kinds of challenges. Challenges consist of two parts, goals and constraints. Goals affect uh, feel by giving the player a way to measure his or her performance. With a goal, it's possible to fail or succeed. It's also possible to fail partially uh, and to do better or worse than the last attempt. This creates players' nebul nebulous perception of their own skill, their own ability to translate intent into reality. Depending on this perception, the feel of the game will fluctuate between clumsy and intuitive. In addition, the nature of the goal uh, shape changes the player's focus. As in Cursor Attack, the feel of real-time control changes depending on, on how the player is tasked with applying it. Does the goal require the player to make uh, ex extremely precise, specific emotions like Cursor Attack? Or is it more wide open, like Banjo-Kazooie? How fast do the characters move? How far apart are the objects they're being asked to move in reference to? And are they meant to avoid them, collect them, or touch them lightly? This is much of the art of game design as it pertains to game feel. What the players are supposed to do is important as the controls that enable them to do it. <laughs> Challenges give meaning to motion, enabling sensations of control to sustain Engagement across the whole game. Hmm. A single goal can create multiple layers of interactions. For example, a high-level goal like reach the top of the mountain may require many steps to execute, but eventually it all trickles down to the level of real-time content. Reaching the, the top of the mountains means swinging to the next pole, and the next, and so on. Constraint affects game feel by explicitly limiting motion. Instead of emphasizing motion, a constraint uh, selectively removes some motions uh, from the possibility space. For example, the sidelines of a football field eliminate some possible motions, uh, rewarding players who can quickly change directions side to side, and are good at exploiting gaps in the opposing team's defense. There were no sidelines in football. A player could run endlessly in a direction to ev evade defenders, and the uh, essential skills would change. The same is true when we say that hitting an asteroid causes you to lose the life in asteroids. 
By limiting motion, the player is again focused on particular motions, which changes the feel of control. Goal, get star. Intent, get to mountain. Uh, intent, swim to next pole. These two goals, constraint and goal, uh, these two tools, excuse me, constraints and goals, enable game designers to shape real-time control into a specific feel. Tools to emphasize certain parts of the possible motion, while constraints specifically eliminate others. The result is the feel as the game designer wanted it to be. But what should the game designer's uh, desired feel be? This is up to the to the designer, of course, um, but I find this question often answers itself through experimentation. For the prototype of real-time control, uh, featuring an avatar uh, moving around an exploratory space with lots of different shapes and sizes, um, types types of objects to interact interact with, uh, control organically evolves into skills and challenges. Can I get up to the top of the mountain? Can I fly between those mountains without hitting them? Can I jump across this gap? What I'm looking for in such a prototype are the best feeling motions and interactions. In this way, the job of a game designer in crafting game feel is to explore the possibility space of a new mapping, emphasizing the good with goals and pruning the bad with constraints. Game feel changes depending on the skill of the player. When picking up the controls of an unfamiliar game, a player will, will feel inept, clumsy, and disoriented. To an expert player, the same game will feel smooth, crisp, and responsive. The game's control will always be the same from, a, from, an, a, blah, from an objective standpoint. The cold precision of program bits allows uh, no other reality. But feel will change uh, for the player depending on how well they can translate their intention into game reality. Each player will start at a slightly different skill level, depending on past experience and natural aptitude. Uh, will learn a different, will learn at a different rate, and will attain different heights of skill depending on how much he or her or she pra practices. Excuse me. Uh, feel will cha change for the player depending uh, on how well they can translate their intention into game reality. Each player will start at a slightly different skill level, uh, depending on past experience and natural aptitude, and will learn at a different rate and will attain different heights of skill depending on how much he or she practices. This means that, even for a single player, the feel of a game will change over time. This variability uh, makes the feel of even a single game controversial. The argument goes like this, Internet didn't seem one. Whenever I think of what the perfect feel for a game is, I think of Super Mario 64. Other than the camera, the controls were perfect. Internet Denizen 2. God, I hated Mario 64. The controls were terrible. Internet Denizen 1. You don't like the controls because you suck at it, noob. Uh, because both parties are correct, this argument will never be resolved. For Denizen 2, who was unable or, or unwilling to master con the controls of the game, the feel was clumsy and unresponsive. Denizen's one point of view is equally valid. For him, controlling Mario felt like extending himself into the game world. Every movement became an accurate expression of his intent as uh, turning a, a wheel or, or swinging a bat in real life. The point he's making is that without reaching uh, a certain level of skill, a player cannot appreciate the feel of a game. It, that His point about uh, that without reaching a certain level of, of skill, a player cannot appreciate the feel of a game is valid. This is true both for soft immersion skills like rocket jumping and quake, and for deeply nested controls such as the blue sparks in Mario Kart DS. When you're new, uh, you don't use all the moves. In this sense, uh, skill is the price of admission for game feel. But there are also instances uh, when players learn to, to play a game at a very high level and will still say it feels bad to control. For me, uh, the arcade classic Pac-Man embodies this paradox. I enjoy the game, but from an aesthetic point of view, the feel of moving Pac-Man around the maze is stiff, rigid, and unappealing. For the opposite reason, a friend of mine never enjoyed asteroids. The looping grace of the ship is aesthetically pleasing to control, but the skill of avoiding asteroids and shooting alien spacecraft were too unappealing to be worth learning. This implies a relationship between these two different experiences of game feel. The base, aesthetic pleasure of control, and the sensation of learning, practicing, and mastering a skill. This relationship is cyclical, uh, extends across the entire time a player plays a game, and changes game feel constantly. The cycle looks something like figure 1.14. When players first pick up a game, they suck. Players know this and accept it. Skill is the price of admission. And they trust in the game designer. 
If I take the time to learn this and agree to suffer through some frustration, the player says, you agree to give me uh, some great experiences later. I feel at this point it's clumsy, disorienting, and bad. It takes a great deal of conscious effort to perform the most basic task in the game. The pure aesthetic pleasure of control can be used as, as a tonic here, uh, soothing frustration until the first success, but every game starts this way for a new player. Every new player feels clumsy, disoriented, and frustrated during the initial learning phase. Over time, the skills are mastered and get pushed down uh, below the level of conscious processing. The player gradually improves relative to the challenges presented, and the feel gets better and better. Eventually, the player learns the skills well enough and breaks through, completing the current goal. Without the oppressive feeling of clumsiness, the aesthetic sensation of control come to the forefront, combining with the, the satisfaction of a challenge overcoming, overcome to provide a reward for reaching this level of skill. Then the next challenge is introduced and the cycle starts again. The clumsy feel of being unskilled relative to the challenges uh, provide once again, oh, provided once again overwhelms the aesthetic pleasure of control. 1.14 uh, the cycle of skill and game feel, as the player perceives a level of skill changes, so does the feel of control. We have a new, a new challenge being introduced. How intuitive or clumsy uh, is measured on one axis, and boredom and frustration is measured on another. Uh, and then there's a point of frustration within the cycle of success and failure. Objectively, uh, skill always improves over time. Subjectively, players will feel that the controls are al alternately uh, clumsy and intuitive depending on how their skill relates to the challenges the game is currently throwing at them. The best game designers create feel at different levels of skill uh, by knowing the skill of the player and what he or she is thinking about and focusing on. A clever designer can tool game feel differently at, at each level of skill. The insight into a player's skill might come from knowing which level the player is currently on, from which items uh, are currently in the player's inventory, or from extensively playtesting in a multiplayer game. For example, if a player is on level 12 and the progression of levels is linear, he can assume he or she has mastered the skills necessary to complete the first 11, le el first 11 levels. You know the skill uh, that was learned last, what the player will be, f what the player will, will be focused on, which skills are completely re reflexive, those already mastered, and which skills have not yet been encountered. With this knowledge, it's possible to shape the feel of a game across time. Guiding the player this way, a designer can leave breadcrumbs strewn across the possibility space of motion, emphasizing the best possible sensations of control while maintaining a balance of, of skill and challenge. When the player has achieved the, the highest level of mastery, the game will have fulfilled the designer's goal for the best possible game feel. The flow state, when challenge and skill are, are balanced for maximum player engagement. For this to work, however, players must never get bored or frustrated that they stop, so bored or frustrated that they stop playing. Um, if this delicate balance between player skill and game challenges is perfectly maintained, players will enter the flow state. Full theory states that uh, when a challenge you undertake is very close in difficulty to your level of ability, you will enter the flow state, which is characterized by a loss of self-consciousness. Uh, a distorted perception of time, and a host of pleasurable sensations. Uh, researcher Mihaly uh, Csikszentmihalyi correlated the sensation with athletes, dancers, and world-class chess players being in the zone, and having things just flow. The gist is that when your ability matches really well to a particular challenge, you can enter the flow state. If, if your skill is much greater than the challenge offered by a given activity, you'll be bored. If your skill is far below the level of challenge provided, you will be frustrated. Or, as in the case uh, of rock climbing and other dangerous activities, you'll be act anxious. Um, Chick sent me high, says that games uh, are the flow experience par excellence, and for good reason. Video games especially have numerous advantages in creating and maintaining flow, such as providing clear goals, a limited stimulus field, and, a direct, and direct immediate feedback. From the perspective of game field, flow is one of the ideal experiences. When players refer to being immersed in the game, part of what they're experiencing is flow. As the original researchers of flow discovered, uh, entering the flow state and staying there is one of the most rewarding experiences it is possible for people to have. From surgeons to painters to rock climbers, 
Everyone who experienced flow regularly was happier, healthier, more relaxed, and more energetic. And they knew it, loved it, and sought out flow-producing activities because of it. In video games or in real life, fueling this uh, addiction requires taking on even greater challenges to match ever-increasing skills. As these higher levels of skill and challenge are reached, the sensation of control change. A uh, professional counter-strike player, like a professional soccer player, feels the get differently. Intuitive controls. Unlike real life, players may begin to feel that like controls are not accurately translating their intentions into the game. This is another place where game skills are slightly different from real world skills. In real life, you can tr you can try to kick a ball and completely whip it. You've no one to blame but yourself. In a game, the blame can actually lie with the game designer. What's important is the player's perception. Is the inability to translate intent into desired reality because of his or her lack of skill or, or certain problem with the game. Players often blame the controls when they don't get the, the result they intended and sometimes the blame is justified. A game designer is unlikely to map an input to a random result, but there are many instances when unintentional controls, uh, control ambiguities, disrupt the sensation of control by making the player feel as though the game is not accurate, accurately responding to their input. When this happens, when the player feels the game is not accurately translating his or her intention into the game role, it's one of the worst possible feelings. Is game feel uh, anath The sensation is the opposite uh, of what players mean when they say intuitive controls. Intuitive controls mean near perfect translation of the intent into game reality. Players will be able to translate their, their intent into reality with varied degrees of efficiency or efficacy uh, based on their skills. If the thing you're controlling does what you want and expect, um, accurately translating your impulses into the game, the controls are intuitive. Control over the avatar feels like an extension of your own body into the game. There is a distinction between challenge, which makes the game more difficult in the dimension of skill, and interference, which obfuscates intent arbitrarily. Um, put another way, as long as the result of an action is predictable, the goal is clear and the feedback immediate. It will fall off the scale of challenge, or it will fall off the scale of challenge. If not, it's interference noise in the channel between player intent and the game's reality. Uh, when constructing a game mechanic, designers seek the effort elusive worthwhile skill. It's intuitive and easily learned, but deep. It has lyric, expressive quality, but you can uh, hang a game's worth of challenges on it, and it never gets stale. Game feel as an extension of the senses. To play a video game is often to focus uh, intently on a screen, to the exclusion of all else. While this may cause uh, concern among parents, uh, educators, and career-minded politicians, what's happening is not a trance, but a transposition of senses. The screen becomes the player's surrogate visual sense. Instead of looking around and seeing a TV, a couch, uh, and their hands on a controller, players look through uh, the screen into the game world. When players sit and stare, they are not catatonic. Rather, uh, they're they've substituted their visual sense for one in the game world, the extending it outward to a new place. They're looking around, keenly aware of their surroundings in the game. This is because an avatar in a video game is a is kind of a tool. It provides both a potential for action and channel for perception. Consider a hammer. When you hit a nail with a hammer, you can sense the nail head get lower, um, and you can hear the pitch change with each strike, driving the nail downward. These are direct perceptions, but you can also feel the nail through the hammer. With each strike, you can feel the nail driving deeper, um, whether you've hit it square on, whether the nail is beginning to bend, and so on. The tactile feedback is coming back to you through the hammer. The hammer uh, has become an extension of the sense of touch. Now consider the avatar in Katamari Damacy. Controlling the prince of all cosmos uh, is an extension of three senses, sight, hearing, and touch. As a player, uh, I have a goal, to build my Katamari to a certain size. The first step in this goal is to pick up some thumbtacks I can see off to the left of my current position. Once that intent is formed, I begin to take action, pressing forward on the thumbsticks to move the avatar in a direction I want to go. To know whether I'm turning the right amount and when to stop turning and straighten out, I'll use visual feedback from the screen. I'll estimate the distance between avatar and thumbtacks. Uh, each moment, uh, I'll look at how the prince is turning relative to the pressure I'm exerting on the thumbstick and make constant tiny adjustments to maintain the, the proper course. 
This happens in a continuous cycle until I see that I've turned and hear the satis satisfying uh, collect sound. If I run into something that's too large for my Katamari, I see the Katamari stop, see pieces fly, fly off it, hear a crashing sound, see the screen shake, and feel the, the rumble motors and the controllers go off. In each case, uh, a device overwrites one of my senses. The screen becomes vision, speakers, hearing, and rumble motors in the sense of touch. Uh, the feedback from these devices enables me to experience things in the game as if they were objects in my immediate physical reality. I have a sense of moving around the physical space, touching and interacting with objects. The screen, speakers, and controllers have become an extension of my senses into the game world. The game world becomes real because the, the senses of directly, or are directly overwritten by feedback from the game. By hooking into the various senses, a screen, speaker, or a joystick can make the virtual feel real. When game designers create camera behavior, um, implement sound effects, or trigger rumb rumble motors, they're not defining what players see, hear, and feel. Um, rather, they are defining how players will be able to see, feel, and hear in the game. The task is to overwrite real senses with virtual ones. In defining game feel, we must acknowledge this fact and embrace it. To experience game feel is to see through different eyes, hear through different ears, and touch with a different body. From the perspective of the game's of the game designer, the most important part is defining camera behavior. The camera is the player's point of view, the, uh, the point in the game world that represents his or her eyes, uh, determining what view of the game will be displayed on the screen. The first task of a game designer uh, creating a particular feel is mapping input signals to motion. The second task is to create a space and, and objects to give that motion a frame of reference. The, ter the third task is defining the behavior of the camera. There are no games that I'm aware of that use sound or controller rumble as primary feedback for real-time control. It's in interesting to think about how real-time control can be achieved using mostly oral or tactical feedback, but most games are built using visual feedback only, with sounds and controller rumble added as polish effects. This is why uh, creating the camera and its behavior is the third necessary component of a game field prototype. Without any of these three uh, mapping, a basic level layout and camera behavior, the feel of a game is not reliably test is not yeah, it's not reliably testable. For for a designer, uh, these are the three foundations of game feel. Two important decisions to make about a camera are where it will be and how it will be uh, or how it will move relative to the avatar. The combination of where the camera is and how it moves defines the player's impression of speed. Because the camera is not an object being controlled but is also a, an organ of the player's perception, its motion requires some special treatment. Usually, these problems handle themselves. If the camera's movement is too drawing or disorienting, uh, or if the player can't see what they need to see to engage with the challenge of the game, the designer simply iterates uh, until these problems are reduced or mitigated. The most common choices are, don't move the camera more than you have to, move it smoothly when you do, and give the player control when you can't get a good result uh, from program behavior. Otherwise, the camera causes interferences between intent and result, making the camera less intuitive for the player. Worse than that, the motion of a camera can actually cause physical nausea. This is an interesting confirmation that feedback from the screen is overriding visual perception. Motion sickness happens when the signals uh, received by the inner ear don't agree with the signals received by the eyes. For a player who's sitting stationary in a room playing a game on an unmoving screen, uh, to experience motion, visual perception must be extended into the game via the screen. It's no wonder, then, uh, that things like a sudden drop in frame rate are so drawing and feel awful to player. It's as if you, you were walking to the grocery store and your vision suddenly started to stutter and break down. This is also how it's possible for motion sickness to occur when a player is sitting stationary in a room playing a game on an unmoving screen. With the player's eyes in the game on the camera, the flow of the feedback from that sense needs to be smooth and uninterrupted. Game feel and perception. One sense that we might not consider part of the game feel is kinesthesia. Kinesthesia is a sense that detects body position, weight, or movement of the muscles, tendons, and joints. To get fancier, uh, we can talk about pro proprioception. Excuse me. We can talk about proprioception, which is often used interchangeably with uh, kinesthesia. Proprioception has a slightly more precise. Uh, connotation of being a subconscious awareness of the position of his or her body in space. To understand what proprioception is, close your eyes, extend your arm directly out in front of you, 
Touch the ring finger on your right hand with your left hand. The sense that enables you to figure out where your finger is in space without using visual or oral feedback is the proprioceptive sense. When a police officer has you walk uh, a straight line, this is the sense he or she is testing. So how does game feel relate to proprioception? Proprioception comes from a complex and not especially well understood bit of physiology that has to do with the movement of fluids and veins, the sensation of gravity pulling against tendons and muscles. Somehow this all gets assembled into a sense of position in your, uh, of your own body in space. This is why astronauts experience space sickness uh, their first few days in zero gravity and sporadically thereafter. Even though they are highly resilient under extreme gravitational forces, as all astronauts must be, the body becomes disoriented by the lack of proprioceptive feedback. When gravity is taken away, the body loses its sense of up and reacts uh, unpredictably, often in ways which involve a great deal of vomiting in space. Gross. When controlling something in a video game, there is no real proprioceptive space. There can be. As much as you feel your character has become an extension of your body, you will never receive the same kind of proprioceptive muscle-stretching feedback from pressing a button as you get from swinging a tennis racket. So where does that leave us? It seems like proprioception is an important clue, uh, because the feeling of controlling a game is clearly uh, something more than visual and sound alone would indicate. But if we can't actually experience the g-force of a hairpin turn when playing a game, how can we explain why it feels so similar? But why do we lean in our chairs? An interesting example, uh, consider the case of Ian Waterman. At the age of 19, a viral infection destroyed the nerves of his skin and muscles. He can still sense temperature, deep pressure, and muscle fatigue, but his proprioceptive sense is entirely gone. He is able to piece through the, the location of his body in space only by observing it visually or through other subtle cues. If he's standing in his kitchen and the power goes out, he crumbles to the floor, helpless until the light comes back on. What's fascinating is that apparently, uh, his movement now looks mostly normal. With supreme mental effort, he used whatever clues uh, his senses will give him, can also use sound and temperature as, a feed, as feedback about the position of his body to gauge the position of his body in space. On the, on the surface, it seems in many ways to be similar to the experience of steering a virtual object around virtual space. Based on limited feedback, we experience a, a kind of proprioception. We get a sense of the position, size, and weight of, of a virtual object in virtual space. It would be a significant disservice to Mr. Waterman to end our assignment there, though. Even when manipulating something in purely invented digital space, we have a significant advantage. Uh, we still use our sense of the position of our bodies to guide us. What a bunch of cheaters. Information on that can be found here. When you move a mouse, thumbstick, or Wii remote, uh, your proprioceptive sense is still active. Your thumb uh, through the movement, though the movements are small, are still giving you feedback about their position in space and uh, about how much the buttons or, or thumbsticks on the controller is pushing back on them. You have a sense of where your body is in space, even if your primary feedback is coming from virtual objects in virtual space. This way, controlling something in-game is kind of an amplification of your sense of space uh, because you get a huge amount uh, of reactive mileage out of very little real-world motion. It's like a megaphone for your thumbs. You, you're now concerned uh, with how your real-world motion affects virtual objects. The process of motion feedback is transposed. Uh, when we're controlling something in a game, we're using uh, not a debilitative proprioceptive sense, but an amplified one. Part of the experience of game feel, then, is amplified impression of proprioception uh, generated from visual, oral, and tactile feedback. Um, it's an impression created through illusion illusory means, uh, but ex experienced as real by the senses. The sensation of game feel is more than the sum of its parts. Visual, sound, motion, and uh, effects combine to form another sensation altogether. One we might term virtual proprioception. Game feel as an extension of the player's body. When proprioception extends into the game world, uh, so does identity. It's the same thing as uh, what happens when you drive a car. As you drive, you have a sense of the position of the car in space and how far it extends around you. Uh, this enables you to parallel park, drive in a lane next to other cars, and pull into your garage without crashing. 
Your senses extend outward, uh, encompassing the car and receiving feedback. As this happens, the car becomes part of you, uh, an extension of both body and self. This is why people who've crash say you hit me rather than his car hit me or his car hit my car. Where an avatar in a game world feels like an extension of your own body and senses, um, identity flows outward and encompasses it in some way. Game designer Jonathan Blow calls this a uh, proxied embodiment. Identity extends to some kind of proxy inhabiting it and making it part of its own body. My guy becomes me. What's interesting is just how uh, capricious this identity or how capricious this transfer of identity can be. It can flow uh, outward, encompassing something we're controlling, and a moment later be withdrawn. We can say, yes, I am amazing. And we effortless, effort as we effortless, effortlessly uh, wipe out a room full of marines in half-life, and moments later scream, no, Gordon Freeman, you stupid son of a bitch. Uh, that's a bad Gordon Freeman. As we accidentally fall off a cliff to a grisly virtual death. For game designers, uh, this flow of identity is great. It mitigates the, the frustration that comes from challenging the player. A little cursing at the avatar is always preferable to the player becoming bored or frustrating, or frustrated and uh, putting the game down. It provides a nice release for the player who avoids the blame and uh, maintains engagement, getting back to the pleasurable sensation of control more quickly. The extending of identity also gives player the sensation of direct physical contact. It's a mutated sensation, getting hit with a rocket in Quake. Um, it, getting hit with a rocket in Quake is... It's a muted sensation, getting hit with a rocket in Quake is... Uh, one assumes not the sensation of being hit with one in real life, but... Uh, intimate nonetheless. When I'm bumped, jostled, flunged, or impaled... It feels bad because it's as though it's happened to me physically. It's the same sensation as I had hitting a pole in my parents' Volvo. It's not literally painful, but it feels like a personal injury. Like wise, when I'm grabbing, throwing, slashing, or hitting, it feels good because I'm reaching into the game and affecting things directly with a part of my extended virtual body. This is where impression of physical interaction becomes really powerful. Through a combination of polish and simulation, the designer can have players feeling uh, they've hit or been hit, shaping those interactions with great precision. <laughs> Extension of identity isn't something you can design for directly. It grows naturally out of real-time control and can be disrupted by too much frustration, boredom, or ambiguity between intent and outcome. It can also uh, happen to, to greater. It could also happen to to greater or lesser degrees depending on the sense sensitivity of control. For example, I don't feel particularly attached to each falling piece in Tetris. Our time together is fleeting, and I have very low uh, sensitivity uh, control over the block's movement. The block themselves are not anthropomorphic, but this also is less important than the expressivity of the controls. In Asteroids, which also has a, a very simplistic avatar, the transfer of identity is much more pronounced because there's more... Uh, sensitivity inherent in the controls it twirls and curves and narrowly it twirls and curves and narrowly missing asteroids you really feel the extents of the ship focusing on its size and position in space as you steer it around even pong which itself used only blocks as representation had greater uh potential for identity transfer the sensitivity of the paddle controller was high enough to feel like an extension of the senses and the identity this is taken to an extreme in games such as quake there's no barrier between identity and the avatar. Tetris has a very low sensitivity of control, allowing only left and right movement and rotation in a grid. Quick maps uh, a highly sensitive input device, the mouse, directly to rotation of the avatar. As long as it's not fr too frustrating and doesn't suffer from uh, crippling control ambiguity, most sensitive controls will more readily accept a transfer of identity. Game feel is a unique physical reality. Now, I'd, I'd like you to help me in a little experiment. First, picture in your mind what will happen if you were to throw this book across the room and into a wall. Got it? Now, please throw this book across the room and into a wall. Come on, no one's watching. Throw it. I can't, bro. Uh, I'll assume you've thrown or not thrown it according to your personal code of book ethics and have returned to reading. How did your expectations compare to the actual outcome of the book being thrown? 
Now noodle the book around in your hands, feel its weight and heft, and thumb quickly through the pages, listening to the pleasing sound it makes. What did you notice? A paperback book, like this one, is heavy, floppy, and will generally go where you throw it, landing in a heap as the pages fan out of the air. Based on your previous experience with paperback books, this was probably what you assumed would happen when you, you threw it. But how did you know that would happen? If you see a strange book lying on your coffee table, how can you be sure uh, this object you see and recognize this book is truly a, an object uh, made of sheaves of pulped pressed wood bound together into a, flim, into a flimsy brick? The answer is action. You had to throw it to find out. Based on your previous experience with paperback books, uh, you can make a reasonable guess about what would happen. Uh, but the only way to truly experience the physical properties of an object is to observe that that object in motion. As an object interacts with other objects, including your hands, you quickly flush out its physical properties in. Uh, <clears throat> you quickly parse out its physical properties. In a game, the same process of physical perception happens. In this sense, the experience of game feel is a is a kind of fake Newtonian physics. People are good at figuring out the phys physics of a, a virtual space because they're subconsciously familiar with the way things work in the real world. As soon as we encounter a virtual space, we piece together whatever clues we have about the physical laws that govern it into a mental model. We can't help it. It happens quickly and effectively, and it's based on uh, what can be gleaned from the limited stimulus available. Visuals, uh, sounds, and tactile. Visuals, sounds, and tactile feedback and motion. When all these harmonize, the fake physics are seamless. Every tiny clue serves to support the same impressions of physicality, from the simulated collisions through animations, sound, screen shake, and particle effects. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes a piece of feedback will contradict the others, however, uh, and this uh, causes inconsistencies in the player's mental model of the virtual space. Even in the games that do a fantastic job of conveying the, the solid physics of their world, such as Gears of War, there are usually inconsistencies to be found. The character's feet still clip through stairs, for example. In a video game, you don't sit in the thing you're, you're staring and manipulating. You can't, uh, the object you're controlling has no physical form. Objects in a video game are a digital construct in virtual space. However, uh, successfully, they, they attempt to, uh, to mimic the real world can only ever convey an impression of physicality. Creating a good feeling game uh, is in one sense the process of building this impression. Using sound and motion, we give players an entire universe worth of, of physical laws to reconstruct in their heads uh, a mental model of the, phys of the virtual space. This happens in the same way we map uh, physical space we experience every day. The throne book makes noise, thuds, and uh, when it hits the ground, flops in the air, takes a certain trajectory, falls in a certain way, takes a certain amount of heft to launch. But the impression, the generalization, comes from the combination of sound, touch, and motion. Consider the two bowling balls uh, in figure 1.6. Bowling balls. You'd expect that if they own to one another, they will make a satisfying clanking noise and roll away slowly. If, on the other hand, one ball deforms, it makes a dull thud like a beach ball being kicked, and it's violently flung in the direction at, at the moment of impact, what can you surmise about the ball that was punted? At this point, you must assume that one ball is, cl is a clever visual forgery of a bowling ball, a beach ball in a bowling ball's clothing. Even though it looks like a bowling ball, uh, the evidence offered by at least two other types of feedback, oral and motion, Decay overwhelmingly that it is not a true bowling ball. Now look at the ball of figure 1.7. Or 117, excuse me. Uh, what would you expect if these two balls rolled into one another at speed? What if the ping pong ball made a low, ominous humming noise and proceeded to split the bowling ball in half with its crushing power? What would you assume about its physical properties then? Uh, there would be no real world analogy for, you, for what you've just perceived. Mentally, you try to undercover the underlying physical reality. Clearly, even though it looks like a lightweight ping pong ball, it can destroy the bowling ball. It must be made of something solid and heavy. We strive to resolve the, the dis this dissonance by abandoning the visual cue because motion and sound outweigh it. Uh, Evidence-wise. Likewise, uh, a bowling ball, even if we can't hear the sound of it, still conveys heaviness by the way it moves and interacts with other objects. 
Even if visuals and sounds are not congruent, motion will always trump them in creating the sense of creating the sense of impression. This is why things like uh, interpreting objects or bizarre, unpredictable motion are disturbing to the player. For example, the visuals in id Software's Doom 3 were exemplary. Each creature was rendered at a high, uh, normal mapped level of detail, much greater than the games that preceded it. And this was the first major uh, commercial game to use a true lighting model as part of gameplay. Corners could actually be dark, and the critters lurking in there had to be illuminated with a flashlight. Unfortunately, this, these impressive visuals uh, were belied by thin, tinny sounds, especially the shotgun and machine gun effects, and the impossible jerky motion of the everyday objects scattered through the game. Uh, some props would fly and spin like helicopters, taking on a life of their own, while others would not react or, or move at all. This seemed to be no logic to the motion or lack of motion, and it created a powerful dissonance between visuals and motion. <laughs> the impressions uh, of physicality were shattered. As his game designer Brian Moriarty puts it, uh, one reference to anything outside the imaginary world uh, you've created is enough to destroy that world. Compare this to the more recent great feelings of Ge Gears of War. Gears of War had a great use of particle effects, especially sprays of dust as the character slams against walls. Cinematic tricks such as lens distortion, screen shake, exam and exemplary well-produced sound effects. This gave rise to a powerful and, and compelling impression of physicality. As independent game designer Derek Yu puts it, in Gears, it's like you, you're this giant wrecking ball with a gun attached to it, which is pretty sweet. Summary. To answer the question of what game feel is, we started with a basic definition of game feel. Real-time control of virtual objects in a simulated space with interactions emphasized by polish. Using three building blocks encompassed in this definition, real-time control of virtual objects, simulated space and polish effects, it's possible to create uh, great feeling games. We further define great feeling games as games that convey five different types of experience to the player. The aesthetic sensation of control, the pleasure of learning, practicing, and mastering a skill, extensions of the senses, extension of identity, interaction with the unique physical ident identity within the game. Of these five experiences, uh, no single experience encompasses game feel. Rather, game feel is all of these experiences simultaneously. During play, one experience might come to the forefront. The player may feel uh, supremely frustrated, be enthralled for a moment, uh, by a few moments of, of beautiful sensation or control, or feel the, the gory satisfaction of giving an opponent the well-timed rocket. These experiences are not mutually exclusive, and at any time, uh, each is present to some degree. These five experiences of game feel tell us a lot of interesting things about the way players experience game feel and the way game designers utilize game feel. What they don't tell us are the, the processes, physiological and, and psychological, that give us a rise to these, ex to these experiences. To understand what game feel is at these levels, uh, let us now take a slight detour away from human experience into human perception. We'll pick up uh, chapter 2, Game Feel and Human Perception, next time.